Real Virginia is produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau Federation. Become a Farm Bureau member today. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all the wonderful things we enjoy. On this month's show, we'll explore the legacy of champion horses at the State Fair of Virginia. Plus, Andy Hankins tells us how to grow figs from the ground up. And Kendra Bailey Morris uses figs in a recipe for glazed pork tenderloin in the heart of the home. Welcome back, everyone. We are here at Meadow Event Park. It is a site of the State Fair of Virginia and the birthplace of the most well-known horse that ever lived. The year was 1973. It was the year that the world would learn the name of a Virginia horse secretariat after he won the Triple Crown. And this site is where visitors can come to the State Fair and learn more about Secretariat and the amazing horses that came before him. At one time, this Caroline County farm was the center of the horse racing world. In the early morning hours of March 30th, 1970, a reddish brown colt like no other was born here. It was in this foaling shed that the legendary racehorse Secretariat took his first steps. The farm was owned by Christopher Chinnery. At that time, Meadow Farm was a growing stud farm and racehorse breeding operation that had a history of producing racing legends, including Riva Ridge. You know, the early years surely are formative years, and they spent the first two years of their life here. Um, as I said, Secretary was born here in 1970. Riva came here in 1969 as a young foal. Both of them received their early training. Uh, they were nurtured and taken care of by the Meadow grooms. Um, and they both had very good breeding. Leanne Layden co-authored the book Secretariat's Meadow, highlighting the land, the family, and the legend of the racehorse. She says when people visit the State Fair of Virginia, they will have a chance to experience horse racing history. What they take away from the State Fair is that they are really walking in the hoof prints of history. There were other champions here. Hill Prince, 1950 Horse of the Year, raised by Mr. Chinnery, um, First Landing, who sired Reva Ridge, and he was a derby favorite in 1959. There was another horse called Sir Gaylord, who was a full brother to Secretariat, who was a derby favorite. There were some very important horses, some of, and most of them are in the Hall of Fame, that Chris Chinnery bred um, here at the Meadow. Everywhere you look at the Meadow Event Park, you are reminded of the impact of the horse on this land. It is a legacy that fair officials hope will expand into the future. It's just a great facility. It's plenty of space. We can expand it at a future date. We are planning to celebrate uh, Secretariat's run in the Triple Crown this coming May. It'll be the 40th anniversary of that, and we'll bring attention to the site that way and, uh, and try to generate more enthusiasm among the horse enthusiasts across the state. Enthusiasts like Layden hope to reestablish the drive to build the Museum of the Virginia Horse here to celebrate the impact played in Virginia history and at the Meadow. Equine events will take place at the State Fair of Virginia September 28th through October 7th. For more information on the fair and horse events, go to statefairva.org. Long before Secretariat won the Triple Crown and wild ponies of the book Misty of Shinkotink became famous, Virginia's horse industry had already established itself as the birthplace of some of America's first horse legends and breeds. The first horses arrived in the Virginia colonies in 1610. And for more than 400 years, horses have contributed to the state's economic success and stability. Caring, grooming, feeding, transporting, training, sheltering, and providing equipment and land for more than 170,000 horses is big business in Virginia. It involves numerous industries and individuals, from farmers who grow the feed to large animal veterinarians. Virginia's horse industry has a billion dollar impact on the state's economy. When is the best time to bring your flowers in from the garden? Well, according to Mark Viette, it's when you decide to use them and what you're going to use them for. We have more now in the garden. The best time to cut your own flowers from the garden is probably gonna be early in the morning or before the heat of the day really hits. So, you know, at least by 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, 
you want to go out in the garden and cut your flowers. The earlier, the better. It's also important when you're cutting flowers that you try to pick flowers that are beginning to open, not ones that have fully matured. They'll last longer indoors. And this is one of my favorite flowers and it's uh, commonly known as red hot poker. Really, this should be yellow hot poker. And it makes a great plant for arranging. And you just reach down, you can use a shears or a sharp knife, and you just cut your stems like this. Make sure you have a pail with water right there so you can take your flowers and set them right in the cool water as you cut them. When you're cutting different flowers, I like to cut a couple of each. I just don't like to cut one stem. It's either three or five. This is a wonderful summer blooming plant. It's crinum. It's a bulb. It's a tropical bulb. And I just come in and cut a couple of these. Then as I find other things in the garden, I like to use, you know, filler. And this is a perennial status, and it's a great filler plant. So you just reach in and you cut a couple bunches. And it's very easy to use something that is a filler material. And when you're arranging your flowers, it really gives a kind of a nice backdrop to the flowers that you're cutting. Russian sage blooms all summer. It's great. Now, when you're dealing with plants with foliage at the bottom, I sometimes remove and just strip off some of the foliage. But this is a wonderful filler. Again, I like to get maybe three stems of this. And then what I do then is put them in the bucket of water. Now, when I take these flowers, these specific flowers, and rearrange them. Finally, if I'm doing that indoors, I will recut the ends one more time, maybe take an inch or two off um, and recut them. This phlox is also a wonderful long blooming plant, so I'll cut a couple of these and I'll strip them at the same time as I cut them. And you can tell as the day progresses, the leaves start to wilt a little bit and hang downward. So really the key is to get these earlier, the better. I like to match up some of the colors. You have the yellow hot poker with this beautiful golden yellow hosta. So you just come in and these really make a nice filler. I try to get nice healthy leaves anywhere from three to five leaves will work. Just take your arrangement in one hand and take your hosta leaves in the other and just set the hostas around so you have a beautiful arrangement lined with beautiful golden hosta. It's that simple. You can go right out in the garden and cut your own arrangement and have a basket of flowers in like five minutes. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time In the Garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Up next on Real Virginia, Kendra Bailey Morris takes ripe figs from the tree and creates a delicious pork recipe in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Andy Hankins. This month we're going to learn about fig production from the ground up. Stay with us. I was born and raised on a dairy farm in western Rockingham County here in the Shenandoah Valley. Well, the barn here is a wee cover barn. It's a loose housing compost barn. The large fans that are in the barn are 24 feet in diameter, so it's blowing the heat and humidity off the cows and keeping the cows very comfortable. When we built the barn and first put the cows in it, we saw the milk increase three to four pounds a cow a day. Anytime you have a comfortable cow, you always have a clean, wholesome environment. And the better the environment is for the cow, the better the quality of the milk. The more comfortable we can keep the cows, the better we can treat the cows, the better they will treat us as far as milk production, putting more milk in the tank. I'm Gerald Heatwell, a third generation dairy farmer from Virginia, and I'm dedicated to dairy, our cows, our milk, 
and our land. A growing popularity with cooking with figs has Kendra Bailey Morris whipping up something delicious in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Kendra Bailey Morris with the Heart of the Home and today we're going to be making a really interesting recipe. It's a seared pork loin, but we're going to add something a little bit different, which is some fresh figs. And these are Virginia figs and we're going to mix it with a little balsamic vinegar, honey and vanilla. So it's a little bit unusual, but trust me, it totally works when it all comes together in the end. First thing I'm gonna begin by doing is adding some olive oil to my pan. And what I've done here is trimmed a pork loin and I've salted and peppered it generously. And I'm gonna put it in this pan. What we're gonna do is sear this off on all sides in some olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. Okay, so we've had our pork cooking till it's nice and brown and crispy on both sides. And what I'm gonna do now is remove this to a roaster or you could use a baking sheet, it's just, just as fine. And what I've done is I've put it up on a little rack and put some tin foil underneath and I've sprayed all of this really, really well with cooking spray. So this is gonna go into the oven and I've got the oven set on 375. And that's gonna cook for about, uh, I would say 15 minutes or so. This is kind of a small pork loin. So I'm just keeping the same drippings in here from my pork and I'm adding some shallots and some minced garlic. And it's really, really, really fragrant. And I'm gonna saute this around a little bit. And then I've got my fresh figs and these have been quartered and they're very, very ripe. So it's very important to use soft figs here because we're gonna kinda do a bit of a sauce with this. And you want those really, really sweet figs. So I'm sauteing these around. And you don't need to cook them very long, just a minute or two. And what I'm going to do now is remove these to a bowl and set them aside. And some of the garlic and the shallots going to get in there as well, not a problem. Next up, I'm going to add some balsamic vinegar. And this is a very important step. Make sure you step away from the pan when you do that because balsamic vinegar will give off an aroma that will burn your eyes. And you wanna be real careful not to let that happen. And some honey. And I've got equal parts each, about a um, quarter cup or so. I'm also gonna stir in some rosemary. And this is some fresh minced rosemary. You could use dried if you want to. And kind of the secret ingredient here is some vanilla. Okay, so at this point, I'm just gonna cook it for about five minutes, and we're gonna reduce it down till it's a glaze. So we'll be right back. So we've got our balsamic vanilla and honey glaze going here, and I'm gonna throw a couple of figs back in there just to coat it a bit. And you can just see how beautiful the colors are, the purple of the figs. It's really, really, really nice. This is great. So that's good. What I'm gonna do now is take the pork loin, which I've already taken out of the oven, and it's ready to go. Let it, you wanna make sure you let your meats, especially meats like this, rest for at least 10 minutes before you slice into them, which I've already done. And what I'm gonna do is take some of this glaze and just brush it on there, on the pork, like so. And um, I'm gonna go ahead and slice this into pieces. And you can see that this pork is slightly pink in the middle. And as I mentioned before, that's okay. That's what you're going for. This is a very, very healthy dish. So I'm gonna plate this. Just like this. Bring it over and you want to get the good stuff, which is some of these figs. And extra sauce, of course. You gotta have extra sauce. A little extra sauce is drizzle here. And the final touch is gonna be a little sprig of rosemary, so everybody will know there's a little rosemary in it.
And there you have it. You have a seared pork loin in a vanilla honey balsamic glaze with just a touch of uh, rosemary in there. It's delicious. I'm Kendra Bailey Morris for Heart of the Home. Let's get cooking. Recipes from the Heart of the Home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafarmbureau.org. The Virginia Farm Bureau Federation will give Virginians the opportunity to visit six different farms during the Real Virginia Virtual Farm Tour. On October 3rd, Farm Bureau will host an hour-long event featuring video footage of six Virginia farms. The presentation will be hosted live at the State Fair of Virginia's Meadow Pavilion from 7 to 8 p.m. and will be broadcast online at vafarmbureau.org. Watch online and submit your questions to realvirginia.vafb.com. Pork is one of the most popular menu items in America, and as we've seen, it can be prepared in so many different ways. But pork production has really changed and improved over the years, as we will see in this visit to a clean, comfortable, and modern hog farm. Bobby Bryan's been a hog producer since 1953. He's seen a lot of good changes in farming methods and how hogs are raised in those 59 years. When they're out side, they've got to contend with the, uh, the, the elements, whether it be heat, whether it be uh, snow, sleet, rain, whatever, they're well cared for. The biggest change in hog production over those years has been a switch to confined hog houses and contract operations. The houses offer climate controlled conditions for the hogs. And contract farming for the Murphy Brown Company offers improved profit opportunities for Brian and his family. We're more involved in taking care of the animals than we are uh, worrying about uh, whether or not uh, we're going to have feed or what the feed going to cost us and all these other decisions. They make for us rather than us have to make ourselves. Brian farms with his grandson Caleb who takes care of both the hogs and the environmental standards they have to meet. Both federal and state government agencies have strict rules for how they store and apply their waste products. We take soil samples and manure samples every year. They formulate how much Manure needs to be applied to the ground for the conditions of the ground. Like many hog producers, the Bryans not only meet these standards, they exceed them. They won awards for their environmental stewardship. We've actually fenced out all the creeks, all the streams. We fenced out our, our clean water pond. Um, we have boundaries and buffer zones that we have to go by while applying. So there's no chance of manure getting into um, runoff into the creeks, streams, or the pond. One of the other changes hog producers have made over the years is improved veterinary care for their animals. Brian says drugs are carefully prescribed and used only as needed. Hogs are not processed until they are tested healthy and free of any medicines. We use very little if a pig happens to get uh, under the weather for one reason or other, maybe a joint problem or something, we'll pull it out and treat it and identify it and put down the date we gave the medication and so on. In rare occasions we might have to medicate through the water entire house, but uh, that's very rare. Some hog farmers are phasing out the use of gestation crates for mother pigs and their piglets in favor of open pens. Brian says they don't raise young pigs, so this does not affect his operation, but there are pros and cons to both systems. In an open pen system, uh, they are free to roam around within that particular pen, and you know, sometimes you've got boss sales, and they'll go up and nip the, the sow on the back and uh, these kind of things. And, uh, you know, it, it may not be as glamorous for the pig as people may think it is. Whatever production methods are used, Bobby and Caleb say the comfort of their animals is top priority. But it's also a rewarding occupation, one where they're always improving their operation. We both enjoy working on the farm. I graduated high school. That was the first thing I wanted to do was come back to the farm. Been here ever since. Actually, before the high school days I was here. Um, it's just a pleasure to get up every morning and come out and, and be here on the family farm and, and working with my grandfather. We don't do anything the way we did 50 years ago and I don't know why people expect farmers to continue on the farm like they did 50 and 60 years ago. You know, we have cell phones, we have internet, we have uh, medical procedures that wasn't available 50 years ago, but uh, I don't know how we're gonna continue to feed the world if we farm like we did 50 and 60 years ago. With dedicated family farmers like the Bryans, hog farming will continue to improve in the years to come. In Buckingham County, Virginia, I'm Norm Hyde. My journey into dairying began back when I was a child growing up on the farm in Maryland. I love being a dairy farmer because it's an adventure to be a dairy farmer. It's a new beginning every day. A lot of people drive by my dairy farm and they recognize it as being a dairy, 
but they didn't really recognize it as a product until I built the dairy and ice cream store. And when we built that, people associated the ice cream and the milk to this dairy farm. It's a huge responsibility that we have being farmers, and we're proud to be able to do it. Every day we have the opportunity to provide a wholesome product that's vitamin rich and nutrient full. We are very fortunate to be able to raise our families in such a wonderful environment. I am Ken Smith, a fourth generation dairy farmer from the state of Virginia, and I'm dedicated to dairy, my cows, my milk, and my lamb. Homegrown figs are a great addition to any meal, and in fact, fig trees are a great landscape plant, according to Andy Hankins, from the ground up. Today we're here at Swope Farm in rural Virginia Beach with Tony and Juanita Swope, and y'all are growing figs. When you came here and started your farm, why did you select figs as a crop to grow? Because nobody else had them and we had to have something different. How many fig trees have you got? We've got over 100. And how many varieties have you got? We have seven. What are some of the specific varieties that y'all manage? We have Celeste, Brown Turkey, Mission, Button, Lemon, Magnolia, and a sugar fig. Okay. Juanita, I see that this fig has already been opened up by something. What did that damage? A blackbird or a starling. We don't fight bugs, we fight birds. Once they open it like that, certainly couldn't be sold. And no. what, what else happens? It just rots or? Well, we pull them off when they look like that and put them in a little bucket and we feed our turtles in the pond because oh, yeah. they have to eat, so nothing goes to waste. How about other insects and diseases? If a homeowner has a fig tree, do they need to spray it every week or? They, we, they don't require any treatments. Juanita, tell us about this purple variety of figs. This is a mission fig, and it makes beautiful jam. How about this little fig? What is this one? That's a Celeste, and that's my favorite. You I love like to them. pickle those. Oh, it has a good taste to it you? It has a wonderful taste, and it holds up its shape when you cook it. I see you have these fig trees spaced. How far apart are they? They're 25 feet apart. Why do you have them so far apart? Well, we get full production clear around the whole bush by having the distance between them, and it makes it easy to cut the grass and easier to mulch them. Mulching. When do you mulch and what do you mulch with? We use horse manure and we do it late in the fall. Well, Anita, okay. tell us about this big jam. It's delicious on biscuits, rolls, peanut butter sandwiches. This is with rum, and you serve it over ice cream. This uh, one says fig jam with lemon, mm -hmm. and that's a different, that almost looks like strawberries or something there. Why well, I mixed different three different colors together, wow. and different s times of the year, they have different colors because they get more sun as the summer progresses. We've been talking about how figs are good for people to grow to eat figs. Does it also make a good addition to a formal landscape? It does. It makes a beautiful bush. How old is this fig tree? It was put in in 1971. Over 40 years. Have you done anything to take care of it in the landscape? We have to clip it every other year because it gets ahead of us. We can't pick the ones at the top. It certainly is beautiful. For more information about fig production, contact your local Virginia Cooperative Extension office. This is Andy Hankins. We'll see you next time on From the Ground Up. We're so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty that Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in our kitchens, our gardens, or our wide open spaces, this is real Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching. Make it a good mom. Chesapeake Bay.